Our guest right now, when I say live in the gimmick, he lives the gimmick. He's got the beard, he's got the hat, he's got the face, he's got the he's got the everything. Uh, and he's also got the I've run almost sixteen thousand miles because I just love Forrest Gump. Becoming Forrest in paperback, this is the true story of the journey of Rob Pope. He's a Brit. And he came over to the U.S. to recreate the Forrest Gump run. Now, I don't know why he did it. Well, I have an idea. But I think he's a little crazy. Nobody runs that much and means it. You know what I mean? Uh, Rob, how are you, my friend? I'm grand. I'm, I'm, I'm glad, glad to be back in the States, even in virtual form. <laughs> okay, so you did this run in the United States. What year are we talking about here? So we're looking at fall of 2016 through to spring 2018. Did you get any media coverage on us? Yeah, little bits and bobs. It was sort of a, it was it was up up and down. You know, sometimes you get to a place like New York and you you wouldn't really get much at all, and then you go somewhere like uh, you know Boston and and you know you were the talk of the town. So. Uh, it wasn't what I was doing it for, but it was nice because I was obviously raising money for the charities, and so uh, every every chance I got to talk about them, I would certainly take it. Okay, so that was the that was that that was it. There was this was a whole charity thing, right? This isn't because you want to do cosplay and have this weird sexual fetish with Forrest Gump. This is all about charity, right? <laughs> I think I'd pick up better for the cosplay if that was my vibe, you know. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I wanted to run across the States for about, uh, well, maybe about 10, 15 years before I actually set foot, uh, to, you know, to be in, in my Cortez. And uh, I'd, I'd read a book by another Brit, and so the way he did describe the country as someone from outside, uh, it just looked incredible, and so I'd want to do that one day. And the classic route is usually from either L.A. or San Fran across to New York, and so I thought about doing that. And as often happens, life gets in the way, doesn't it? Um, and so, you know, 15 years down the line. Now, even prior to that, sort of my mum, who's not around anymore, uh, had said, you know, to me to do one thing in my life that made a difference. And I didn't like devote any significant thought to, oh my God, I've got to fulfill this wish. But when everything fell into place, and I just thought, well, let's run across America and do something big for charity. And in the movie, when Forrest goes across the Mississippi, they'd say, oh, you're running for world peace, women's rights, the homeless, mm -hmm. uh, the environment, or animals. And I picked two charities so the Worldwide Fund for Nature and Peace Direct that through all their projects ticks all those boxes and uh yeah set out to see if i could make a difference did, did you have anybody stop you like in the movie and and say you know come up with a I have a nice day idea or um what's the bumper sticker uh shit happens you know uh, uh it, it, did you have any of that I kind of stuff american tv american tv they often censor that sticker don't they and it's it happens and it goes man you just stepped in a massive pile <laughs> and then it stops maybe that's in certain states but uh yeah that amused me but the, the amount of times where you know i was in la and like uh, this uh, 11 year old kid like I, i'm running past and i had the cap on but he wouldn't have seen that he's just a dude in a red cap and he just goes run forest run and i stop and I turn around to look at him, and he just thinks, oh, my God, I'm going to get my head kicked in here. And so I just sort of walk over to him, don't say anything, and just point at the cap, and he's just like, oh, my God. <laughs> 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 but, um, my favorite one was when I was in Texas, and um, I was in a town called Gomez. I say a town, it's like a church in three houses. And um, I, I really needed to, to go and take a crap, basically. And I knock on the first two houses, nobody's in. I knock on the third one, a guy who's like still in his late 70s, maybe early 80s, opens and asks him, can he use his bathroom, go through. And then I couldn't find any toilet paper anywhere, so I had to go out and embarrassingly ask, does he have any toilet paper? So now he knows exactly what I'm doing in his house. <laughs> and on the way out, so I just head down and go, thank you very much there, you know, and out the door and he goes, sit down, I want to talk to you. And then I'm like, oh, I've got to, I've got to be polite, haven't I? And so I sit down, and then he says, 
Last night, I watched this movie called Forrest Gump. Have you heard of it? And I just said, uh, yeah. And he just goes, because you look exactly like that guy. And then so I, so I talk, told him what I was doing. And he, he basically said that his kids had been trying to put him in a care home for years. And if he told them that day that Forrest Gump said, come and take a dump in his toilet, he said he'd be off to the home before they could say, have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> what a great story. Do you, you do know where, you do know where uh, those scenes of Forrest Gump being on the bench and whatnot, where they were filmed, right? Yeah, like the, well, the bench, Savannah was one of the yeah. places I literally only passed through sort of on, on, on a coach uh, one day and I was trying to get to a, a destination coming back from the airport. Yeah. And uh, that bench has been moved now to the museum. And so one day, I think maybe, like sort of, uh, I would love to go back to where I finished, which is in Monument Valley, and run to the ocean just one final time. Um, and then maybe I'll go to um, Savannah. I'll go to like the local Home Depot, just buy a bench, and then put it in that spot on the square so I can take the uh, <laughs> take the photo, and then I'll just take the bench back to the store and say it's the wrong color for my garden. You know. <laughs> you, you know, it, it's it's funny that we have you on the show because I just did a cross country trip from Atlanta to Sacramento, California, where we've relocated. And I always wanted to do a cross-country road trip. I didn't ever want it to run it, but I've wanted to drive it. And as we were crossing the states and seeing every season and every topography, and it, I mean, you name it, we, we got to see it. The entire trip, numerous times, I'm thinking of that scene in Forrest Gump where he's explaining to Jenny the different skies that he would see. And that yeah. just, it just it, it kept it kept playing back in my mind as we were going through this flat stretch of Oklahoma. Stretch of o- and then we'd go up into the elevation in Arizona and California. And then we hit the snow in Flagstaff. And all I could think of was that scene. So it's funny how powerful that movie is, right? After all these years, especially. Yeah, like the, that. That you know, when he says the, what that clear mountain lake, it was if the you know, says the the mountains were reflected in in, in the water, and so that's actually up in uh, Glacier National Park in Montana, and I ran through that, um, and then in that scene earlier in the film, you see him actually running over that three arch bridge with the mountains in the background, yeah. and so I got to run over that sort of a uh, bridge. But of course, it's very surreal because you imagine you always imagine that looking from the side. And so I was then suddenly running over the bridge, and it was really weird. So it's, it's a bit like, you know, the stormtroopers watching that fight with uh, Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi mm. in Star Wars. Mm. You know, it, then suddenly I was Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> <laughs> Darth Vader looks very different close up. Ben! <laughs> and then you get struck down. Did, did, you, yeah. did, did, you, uh, did you wear the old school Nikes? I did, yeah. I, I started in that, um, and so like when I was sat on a rocking chair outside uh, the Bragg Mitchell Mansion in, in uh, Mobile, um, I had that on. I had sort of the khaki slacks, the plaid shirt, and then I yeah, sort of ran through town, uh, took a left rather than the right, got <laughs> definitely on the wrong side of the tracks, and I asked the lady who sat in a um, sort of a, a like a supermarket car park for directions, <clears throat> and a window was slightly open as I approached the car and as I approached the car the window went fully up and I was just like oh no no just look at the directions I'm running across America and that wasn't very promising seeing as like only three miles into the whole run but uh, yeah like so I actually used the Cortez in the Boston Marathon itself as well I actually ran that as part of the journey and uh, they're pretty good running shoes you know so you don't have to have anything fancy that's the best thing about running everyone thinks I need that have these like two hundred dollar shoes, and you know you can pretty much just get anything and, and get going. It's only when you get super serious you need to spend a bit of money. Yeah, I would think that you know you would have prepped for this and got a sponsor, and you know whether it's Nike or Asics Nike or Brooks or, or something to that effect. But you're what you were just saying is you, you didn't have anyone around you. You didn't have a pace car. You didn't have somebody to watch your back. You literally did this by yourself, huh? 
Well, well, half of it by myself, like, a bit, but not much better the rest of the time because my, my crew uh, extended to a maximum of two, but that was only ever for, like, about a week at a time. It was usually uh, only my wife, and we bought a cheap camper that we hoped to sell at the end for what we paid for it uh, because it was so old. Uh, and, of course, if you got a boat, you got to give her a name, and so we, we called our camper Gen A. Um, and so Nadine was with me for about just under half of the time. And um, But, yeah, like, it was completely self-funded, um, and we used money that we would, we'd saved to, like, put a deposit on a house and... Wow. So yeah, like so I managed to start. I, 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 I kind of semi broke into Nike's UK headquarters and, and pretended I had a meeting there when I didn't and they gave me four pairs of shoes which didn't last very long. <laughs> um and eventually when I got up to Oregon I competed in the um the Prefontaine uh, Memorial ten K race. Uh, and somehow managed to win it and became Oregon State 10K champion. <laughs> and at the end, uh, I was chatting with a guy who um, designs trail shoes for Nike, and he, he was like, why haven't we heard of you? And I said, I've, I've sent you about 100 emails. <laughs> I've just got into your spam folder. And, uh, and the, this guy, Johnny, Johnny Wild Horse Truax, the best name I think I've ever heard, um, you know, he then sought me out with a few pairs of trainers afterwards. And so, yeah, like, cheers to Johnny if he's listening. Uh, yeah, Oregon, that's the, what, the headquarters, the home base, uh, where everything started for Nike, right? Uh, so so how, how did that conversation, I was going to ask if you were married, you said your your wife, how did that conversation go? Did you sit her down and say, look, I know we're about to buy our dream home, our forever home, if you will, but I've got this idea. Why don't we go to the United States? You hang out with me for a couple of days, and I want to run almost 16,000 miles, but I'm doing it for a good cause. The only issue is I need all the money we've saved for this new dream house. How did that conversation go? Well, fortunately, I didn't have to drop that last sentence in because we were <laughs> cast iron in the belief that we get across to, you know, we're going to L.A. Right? So it's it's where, where, where all the dreams come to, right? Yeah. And so we figured we'll get to Santa Monica and then they'd be like, oh, well, I've done for a run across America. It's a small club, you know, sort of, um, but are you flying home? And then we turn around and then we thought, oh, there's definitely going to be sponsors. So we, th we thought, well, let's think about sort of 10,000 into this. And then after that, it will get paid for. But because the, the, my athletic aim was to get to Santa Monica, so that dream was fulfilled. I could have quit then and been relatively happy. But it now morphed into this desire to make a difference. And so after that, it was about the charities. And so we thought, well, let's just keep going. You know, so the forest kept going. The only thing that was going to stop me was being physically broken or financially having nothing. I couldn't have gone home with 5K in the bank and, and thought, you know, oh, I've given everything I've got. You know, so we just carried on going, thinking, well, we'll definitely get a sponsor when we get to New York or Maine and turn around again. And then we'll definitely get a sponsor by the time we get to San Francisco, because that's uh, where all the crazy are. They're all into the, <laughs> they're all into the business and the running. Um, by the time we got to San Francisco, we were flat broke, you know. And so at this point, like, um, the, the charity, uh, WWF, offered to put some money towards the run because they realized that it was a massive vehicle for them, but I, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it, it just didn't sit with me. So um, you got, you'd be running down the road and someone would, you know, shake your hand and you'd realize that there was a, you know, a $20 note in it. And I would literally, I was living like a day to day, week to week. And eventually, um, well, sort of, I've got a very soft spot for Atlanta because there's um, a, a lady and her family called Tyvee, um, and sort of, uh, she is the future mother-in-law of a good friend of mine, and so she sent me um, a few dollars to keep going and paid for me to go over to their place from St. Louis for Thanksgiving. And I go away to Thanksgiving for a few days, hand over control of my social media to a pal because I just wanted to switch off for a couple of days and then when I come back he'd publicised the Just Giving page which enabled me to get to the end so uh, yeah it mm. was it was interesting my advice to anyone to do this is be independently wealthy <laughs> <laughs> what did you do before uh, you, you just you decided to, to run across the United States uh, 
so I was, and I'm, and once again, I'm, I'm a veterinarian, so like sort of, uh, yeah, I'm on night shift tonight, so this, this is my, this is a nice way to start my day. Gotcha. All right, and I'm sure during this run, you had. Uh, the, I mean, it was the, you know, when I was tired, I slept when I needed to use the toilet. Well, you know, I used the toilet, you know, so you, it wasn't a race. It was just a mission. Yeah, exactly. I, I sort of liken it a little bit to being like, a, you know, a race car driver and you can't, you know, literally just put your foot flat down on the pedal because, you know, you'll burn through your fuel, you'll you'll pop a tire, something will something will break. So you're constantly thinking about, you know, to getting, you know, to the, the food into you, where are you gonna sleep? You know, is that niggle in my knee something worth worrying about? Shall I, you know, shall I take a little bit air slower? And yeah, it was it was a, a war of attrition. It was much more mental than physical, but of course, you know, the the, the physical was there. And in terms of you know, I very rarely got genuinely tired the physical strife was generally pain. That was, that was, that was the worst of it. Mm -hmm. Nikki, do you have a question for Rob? Did you run the entire time or did you run a little bit, walk a little bit, or was it constant running every time you were out? Originally, I was I was running everything, and I remember like sort of, um, the first couple of days in Alabama. Uh, Nadine said to me, "She said you're just running too fast." And I'm like, "I'm not. I'm fine. I'm not out of breath. This is good. This is going to come back and get you." And about 400 miles in, I got injured in uh, in Houston, which is ironically where we uh, landed to, to travel to to Alabama, and I had a meltdown in a gas station where. Uh, the lovely lady behind the behind the desk like, sort of, uh, asked what I was doing, and I handed over my last handwritten card, you know, because it wasn't a pro operation of my charities, etc. And I just broke down in tears. And she comes round the uh, the counter, gives me a big hug, and I said, like, sort of, uh, I'm really sorry, I'm very sweaty. And she said, We're all sweaty down here, hon. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and she like consoled me and said, like, you know, go and see a doctor and. Uh, I actually saw a physio in Houston called Whitney, and I'm so to this day I'm so upset that I didn't make the joke. Uh, you know, when I was actually in in the treatment room with her, uh, she she patched me up, and I spoke to someone who'd run across America before. He looked at my data and he said, "Rob, you're just running too fast." He said, "You need to you need to throw walking bits in there," and I said, "Yeah, I'm not." I'm not walking across America, though, Chris, am I? I'm, I'm not trying to run across America. And he says, even people who are going for speed records across America will intersperse running with walking. So I found what worked for me was I would run four miles, uh, roughly. Uh, let's say I had a 40-mile day, and I would break it down to five, eight-mile runs, and I would run four miles, walk half a mile, run two, walk half a mile, run one, and then take a break where I'd like, be at a gas station little sort of a diner or something like that and then repeat it so you know it was all about hitting these small goals and uh, when I was walking of course I could take in all these incredible views that you were referring to before you know and, and actually taking the super important thing of just turning around and looking behind you because I you know I, I was going to be missing half of the sights if I if I never turned around. Uh, so you when when you're running your four miles, you're stopping and you're walking. Did did you ever get bored? Mm -hmm. I mean, like this is not taking ten right. minutes. Like I would I would be like, I would... bored to tears sitting there going, okay, I'm in the middle of nowhere, no one's around me, I'm cold, I'm tired, I'm cramping, I'm hungry, I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> I quit. I want to be done. Yeah. But there was always so much to think about, especially because, like, you know, the fact that we were operating on a shoestring budget, so, you know, it wasn't as if I could go, right, where's the nearest holiday in? If I was staying in a motel, it was going to be the cheapest one in town. I'd literally just look on the TripAdvisor and go, do any of the reviews mention bed books? And if they did, that was the only thing that was going to be an out for me. As long as it had a lock on the door and clean sheets, I didn't care, you know? Um, and so I would do some couch surfing as well. So sometimes I'd reach out to like, you know, even like I think the second day I was completely sold, I reached out to a local Mexican restaurant. And then a few of the guys in the restaurant afterwards just sort of clubbed together and, and uh, put me in a local sort of um, a local motel. And yeah, then it was like, what am I going to eat? You know, sort of uh, doing posts for the charities. And then of course, 
I had the opportunity to soundtrack my day. So I could be, you know, in the desert listening to Neil Young, you know, in, in New Jersey listening to Springsteen. And so it was very rare. I, I, I genuinely can't. I remember times when I got a bit lonely, but I don't think I ever got bored. I was also going to ask you what you were listening to. You're listening to all American artists. You're not ris- listening to the Stones or the Beatles or Beatles. Um, you know. Yeah, to be fair, I'm, I'm from Liverpool, um, and of course, the Long and Winding Road was very was very apt and stuff. But uh, yeah, I didn't listen to a huge amount of Beatles, but I got I did get massively into the Stones because not being funny, the Stones is American music, isn't it? it, it you know, it's, it's, it's the blues, and um, and yeah. I listened to U2 uh, on loop as I ran through Joshua Tree, and yeah. I became the first person ever to run from Joshua Tree National Park to the actual Joshua Tree, which is in Death Valley. Yeah. Um, and so I found it high on a desert plain where the streets have no name and all that, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> There's actually a little plaque when you find the Joshua Tree uh, that says, have you found what you're looking for, which I just think is brilliant. That is awesome. And did Bono reach out to you and say, hey, thanks for running to our tree? <laughs> um, he, he didn't know unfortunately but I did get to see him in Chicago not personally but uh, I was with about another 70,000 other people and so <laughs> for my sins I'm a, I'm a Chicago Birds fan and I have been since 1985 uh, when, when things were a bit better um, yeah. and so I was super excited to get to Chicago um, and then to, uh, having the opportunity to see you two uh, at Soldier Field was, was unbelievable but uh, like just, just like being in upstate New York and listening to Bob Dylan was just unbelievable. The the amount of serendipity I would get with music. Now, I mentioned Bruce before. I was in New Mexico and I did a little bit of, well, I didn't know it was semi-trespassing, although the barbed wire fence may have given it away. Um, and I crawled under this fence and I carried on running. It was across some Union Pacific land. And as I popped out onto the highway, uh, Born to Run comes on on shuffle for the first time. I was never going to select that tune. That had to get delivered to me, you know, so from a big library. Here comes Born to Run. And I run past an intersection, and the sign told me that I was on Highway 9, which, of course, is the the, the highway mentioned in the song. And I was just like, nah, man. So this is the Truman Show. There's absolutely no way that this has happened for real, you know. But look, look to see if there are any cameras behind any cactuses, but... You know, no, it's <laughs> just brilliant. When we were driving cross we country, driving. I, I didn't, I, I guess I'm just an idiot, but I didn't know how big of a deal uh, Interstate 66 is. And I guess it's in all these movies yeah. and 66. Steve McQueen and the cars and, you know, all that stuff. Um, and my wife is like, oh my God, we're on 66. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, we are. Because this is, are you not excited? I'm like, no, I'm not. I would be super excited. Yeah, everybody knows it but me. I'm the only idiot out there. I had no idea the, the significance of, really? the, of the interstate, of the road. Yeah. Yes. It's everywhere. Every, oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, there's shirts. Mm-hmm. You know, we would stop, stop and say Route yeah. 66. Yeah. Songs and everything. Yeah. What's that, Rob? It's the ultimate 66. It's like an, it is the analogy for America. Like so you, you can take whatever you want from that, you know, because like there's the progress, whether you see progress as a good thing or a bad thing. So I-40 like obliterated big part of 66 and people say, oh, that's progress because I can now get across the country really quickly. Uh, and then it's not progress because you see all these little towns sort of... Um, Right. You know, dying, and I stayed in one uh, called Adrian, which is the exact midpoint of Route 66, and uh, I managed to get food poisoning. Um, mm. I'm not sure whether it was like a dodgy hot dog or something, and I spent like five days like holed up in this motel. I lost 10% of my body weight, um, but like, what a place! You know, if I was ever going to get food poisoning, it's just there. You know, and uh, I always tried to stay at these um, lovely small motels if I could. You know, just because the ability of like you see like the, these towns in America that are on the up and towns are on the way down, and life just adapts. You know, sort of. Um, and this lady had taken over the motel. She it was you know she was trying to renovate. It didn't look like she had a huge amount of money. On day three, when I went back to pay for another day, uh, and said I'm still really ill, I'm really sorry. She refused to take my money. And she just said, you've paid enough, rest here and just get well. 
Mm. And that was just indicative of the, the kindness that I saw on the way. And so it, it's one of these sort of things where I'm, I'm almost evangelical about it now because... Um, the way that the media sort of goes on these days, like, sort of, you know, you're either for us or against us. There's no, like, sort of, you know, everyone's got, like, the sort of relatives whose opinions they disagree with, whether it's political or socioeconomical, but we still love them, and we don't call them an idiot and hate them and sort of, you know, sort of wish wish fire and brimstone upon us, but that's what we're like. It's the same in the UK. It's not, not a go at America. Um, you know, it's, it's all so polarised, and so I was a vulnerable sort of person out on the road and I saw that people just want to help people you know and the the key thing is actually talking face to face and not you know on on the social side of things you know like you'd never dream of talking to somebody in real life like you would do on social media and um I, I just think there's so much like there's so much to worry about in the States at the moment, but I personally think that there's so much optimism and it will get fixed, and I'm not having any other opinion. <laughs> yeah. So don't give us – well, answer this. Did you keep track of how many calories you burned throughout your 15,621 miles? Don't give us the answer, but yes or no. I had an idea what I was doing. Okay. I didn't, I didn't do it daily. Look right. at their record. All right, so you have an idea. Let's take some guesses. Nate, do you want to guess how many calories Rob Pope burned through while running almost 16,000 miles across the United States? Uh, 100,000. 100,000. I think that's a good guess. Good starting point. Nikki? I'm going to say 250,000. 250,000. I'm going to split the difference. I'm going to go 175,000. <laughs> Rob Pope, how many calories how did many? you burn running 15,621 miles? I've just got my calculator and done some rudimentary maths based on a, a, a guesstimate of 6,000 per day, and it comes up with two million five hundred and thirty two thousand <laughs> <laughs> we were way off. we're a bunch of idiots <laughs> two mi- so how much weight did you yeah. lose on this uh i gained two pounds what? Uh, water weight muscle i gained two pounds i started at 145 and finished at 147 that's crazy. <laughs> that, so, so you don't recommend anyone that's trying to lose weight to run almost sixteen thousand miles? <laughs> that would be it. Uh, Nate, do you have a question for Rob? Nate. Yeah, Rob. So, <clears throat> I'm, I, I assume you got some injury. Two and a half million calories. What's that for? for like. All right, Nate, Nate, go ahead and ask Rob a question, please. Rob, for your ultra long distance running, I'm sure you get you, you get a lot of injuries or, or you know minor or major injuries. What's like the worst thing? Like shin splints? And what do you, what do your feet look like when you're done? Like what's the the worst type of injury from running for so long? Yeah, like so I, I got the expected blisters about two weeks in, and they they took up probably about like twenty five percent of the surface of my foot at one point. But you know they pop, you know, to the bit. It was a, a, like a glorious release running down the road one day where you see your shoe get a bit wet, and you go, okay, that's the blister gone. But then they never came back really. Um, I did get a type of shin splints, which is a, a tendonitis in a muscle called the anterior tibialis, and that was the Houston injury. Uh, which had got sorted with um, with tape in K tape and uh, and altering um, the pace I was running at. I then got Achilles tendonitis, which many like sort of runners will like take a sharp and take a breath because that is a real game changer eight weeks out and I just taped it up and carried on going um, going from Arkansas into Memphis I tore a quad uh, I had a great two tear of my quad and um, I had like two days where I physically just literally couldn't even walk to the bathroom I had to hop uh, but day three I like walk 27 miles day four i walk 32 and then i start bringing little bits of running in um the, the the real kicker though the one that did affect me for a long time afterwards was um was just the result of not taking enough care with stretching and, and, and core strength 
and so my posture changed where I'd start to run in a bit, almost a bit, bit like a V shape. But like, and you often quite see that in in older fellows who were running uh, like a little bit hunched over, and I had that stroller, and it made my pelvis tilt. And there's a disease called osteitis pubis, uh, which is mostly a disease of uh, like the Australian rules footballers and pregnant ladies, uh, where their pelvis gets pulled in so many different directions that you get big inflammation. So uh, that that dogged me for a long time, and uh, it was the kind of thing where it would really hurt on my left side. So I was taking about sixty thousand steps a day. So if it was just my left side that day, I would be waking up to thirty-three thousand doses of pain. And if it was um, if it was both sides, it'd be sixty-six. <laughs> I just got on with it, though. You got to have you? Wow. Well, last question for you, and then we'll let you go. How much money did you eventually raise for WWF, not the wrestling, but the World Wildlife Foundation, and Peace Direct? So, it, in total, it ended up around sort of $80,000, um, which I was really disappointed in because I just figured, given the, the, the size of the run, I figured, yeah. hey, this, this could be a million dollar, you know, thing, and uh, and I beat myself up for a long time after the run. That even though I, I I did the athletic side of things, it was still a failure there. But I spoke to the charity about it, and they just said they reckon it, it got them around a quarter of a million pounds worth of free advertising. So don't be too harsh on myself. Yeah, I, I, you know, if I, anything I'd say is that it, whoever your PR people were didn't really do a great job because if you were running through Atlanta, you know, and I, and I know it's up to the local media to do it, but there has to be a catch a pull. I mean, I think that if it pitched properly to any market, Hey, this guy, Rob, he's from, you know, from the UK, he's coming to the United States. He's running, he's doing the Forrest Gump run. He looks like him. He dresses like him. He's a big fan of it. You know, this is his story. I don't see any, you know, that's great filler content outside of the the hate stuff that we love to put on the yeah, news it should have definitely got more attention absolutely so next time you do this to raise more money you get a hold of of of, of us all right the bs <laughs> and you say hey guys i need you to be my pr team and we'll make sure you raise a million plus dollars for these charities okay well, I, I definitely want to come back one day, so I can't, I can't get enough for the states and, and all of you guys. And so, yeah, that 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 would be brilliant. I've got seven states that I didn't touch on the run, and uh, I think sort of I need to link that up to the original route, and uh, and that, then maybe my running days will be over. What are the seven states? Um, so we got Alaska, uh-huh. which will be uh, fun. Uh, Hawaii, which will be very fun. Uh-huh. Um, South Dakota and Iowa, which will be sort of expansive. West Virginia, which will be hilly and tree. <laughs> Rhode Island, which will be brief. And then Florida. And maybe I could finish up in Savannah from Florida as well and get to sit on that bench. Well, yeah. It, or you could run into Florida and finish off at the tip in Key West and stand at that point. You know, that would be, that, that'd be pretty cool. That'd be, that'd be pretty neat too. It's a, it's a neat spot at the very end, you know, they've got, you know, this is the end and that kind of yeah. thing. And you can see Cuba off in the distance. Nice. <laughs> uh, so your uh, social at run Rob LA run. That's your Instagram, Twitter. That's the one. Yeah. Run, run Ra- Rob, Larson. run Rob, La run. LA. Rob La, yeah. Rob R-O-B-L-A. R-O-B-L-A. It's like Run Forest Run, and uh, Rob La is the nickname that Nadine gives me. Oh, okay. Rob La. There okay. you go, Rob La. It's not L.A. I'm thinking Los Angeles. La. It's Run Rob La. That's, yeah. that's what Nadine is like, a little pet name <laughs> <Yeah>. for Rob. <laughs> he's, he's, not the, he's not the Poper or anything. He's the Rob La. All right, uh, Becoming Forest is the book. You can grab that Amazon anywhere you grab books. I would highly suggest... You read the entire story of Rob Pope. Um, Remarkable individual. The world needs more Rob Popes in the world doing things for good and not expecting anything in return. Yes. That's the good stuff. That's the good stuff. And you're a good man, Rob. So thanks for coming on and sharing the story with us. Thanks, guys. You guys are awesome. Take care. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye, Rob.